Aloha coffee drinkers. Welcome to the masterclass. I'm looking forward this morning to talking to you about all fun things coffee. Today's program is sort of broken into two parts. The goal at the, of this talk is to understand sort of the things that make your coffee taste the way it's going to taste and also how you can manipulate certain things while brewing to get there. A lot of things are out of your hands. So the first part of the class, we'll talk about some of those things. We're gonna talk about things that happen on the farm or at the site of production near the farm, for example. That'll be a very brief section. Then we'll spend a little more time on brewing and grinding and roasting and all the things that most consumers tend to have a little bit more access to and a little bit more control over. So let's start at the very beginning. Why does our coffee taste the way it does? The really short answer to that is we don't really know. We know a lot of things. We know that if you do thing B versus thing X, the flavor changes. But we don't necessarily know why or how. Sometimes we know that certain things will influence taste and sometimes we, we don't. But we'll just work our way through. There's a lot of room at the end for questions that I am excited to hear those and for you to fill in all the pukas that I might leave out. So where do we start? The very, very beginning of any plant, I think really is to talk about genetics. Within coffee, we think of coffee as this seed that we consume, that we brew into a hot liquid, but it's from a plant. It's the seed of a plant. And within any category of plants, there tends to be lots of species. So coffee is in the genus Coffea. There's officially 124 species in that genus. We really only consider two in our normal daily lives. The rest just haven't been commercialized for all sorts of reasons. There's Coffea conifera, commonly known as Robusta, and Coffea arabica, which is the species more commonly grown and tends to get better reviews when people are tasting it. In Hawaii, almost all the coffee you're ever gonna get is gonna come from Cafe Arabica. And within Hawaii, it's the only species we currently grow commercially. So species will make a big difference on taste. But within a species, there's a subcategory of variety. And a variety is uh, something within a species that is different in some way, how it looks, how it tastes, how it produces chemicals, but similar enough that it we like to label it together as one species. So a more common thing that we're familiar with are apples. There's lots of different apples. They look different, they taste different, but they're all the same species of apple. There's different varieties. Uh, a similar idea is dog breeds. Dogs are all the same species, but different dog shapes and sizes are just different varieties of dogs. But we don't call them varieties, we call them breeds. So all of these things, these genetic differences have a very real impact on flavor. Unfortunately, sometimes that impact is confounded by everything else we're gonna talk about. So you might have one variety that you taste from different places or different processes, and it's gonna taste pretty different, and that taste of the variety may not come through quite so well. So what is the next thing that's gonna have a big impact on that? Environment. The place a plant grows has an influence because plants are stuck there. They can't run away like we can and go and find air conditioning. So one of the most important things that we're gonna see that influences plants, especially coffee, is temperature. As coffee grows in warmer, higher climates, it responds differently, and we recognize that in our taste. There's physiological differences too, we see all those, but what we really care about is the taste. Now what's interesting about temperature is that we often don't think about coffee growing at different temperatures. The industry and most people think of it as growing at different altitudes. And we all know this, as you go up a mountain, it gets colder and the air gets thinner. Well, plants don't care about how thin the air is. They do care about the temperature. So you might find labels and stories and books that all talk about coffee elevation. And that's true to an extent, but it's really about the temperature. And that key idea explains why we can grow really great coffee in Hawaii and have it be at a very low elevation. So, you know, the problem with elevation is that it depends on where you are. Are you in Colombia? Are you in Hawaii? Are you in Burundi? It's hard to compare because all these places are different distance away from the equator. And that's important. The farther you get from the equator, the colder it gets. Also, the higher up you go, the colder it gets. The trick for coffee is for it to find that perfect environment that it does what, it, what we want it to do. I mean, it doesn't really care. It's not growing because it wants, it wants to taste good. We want it to grow so it tastes good for us. So coffee in Hawaii tends to be grown pretty low elevations relative to the rest of the world because it's a better temperature at those elevations because of our latitude. All right, that's environment. Farming. There are lots of ways a farmer can influence their crop. How they prune it, how well they fertilize it, how well they keep pests under control, how well 
they manage the weeds, how well they hmm, sing to it at night. No, I'm just kidding. Singing to coffee doesn't seem to do anything as far as we know. The problem with talking about what the farmer can do is that we don't really know how farmers actions have a positive influence on taste. We know that things can go wrong. We know that trees that aren't as healthy because of lack of food or lack of water or trees that are infested with a lot of insects or diseases taste suboptimal in our, in our um, desires. I mean, again, the plant doesn't care, but we taste it that way. But we don't know if you have so much fertilizer, or so much water that's gonna taste like this or taste this much better. The sort of summation idea is the tasty tree is gonna be a healthy tree. And the best thing a farmer can do is make sure the coffee's reaching its healthful potential. And that's probably gonna make sure it reaches its tasteful potential. So we have this tree growing in this field, a farmer is tending it. And at some point we need to collect this thing off the tree so that we can take it somewhere else to drink. And before we drink it, do lots of things. So we have to harvest it. There's two major ways of harvesting coffee. The most common is to harvest by hand, where people go up to the tree and they slowly pick each fruit one by one, put it in a basket and carry it away. We have developed machines that can harvest coffee. They're a little less selective and there can be selection of the really desirable ripe cherries later on. So we talk about ripe cherries as sort of a strange idea because we never think of coffee as a fruit because the coffee we drink isn't a fruit, it's a seed. So we have to get the fruit off the tree and get the seed out and get all those layers out. And if we don't do that, we don't get the coffee we drink. So the first thing I can actually show you excitingly is that what is a ripe coffee fruit? Well, like any fruits, um, there's usually a green early stage when, there's, when the fruit is still photosynthesizing, it's got some chlorophyll in there. And then as it ripens, as a signal to all sorts of things that want to eat it, it's going to change colors. So I have an example of some coffee fruits here. This is a variety yellow catoyi. Uh, on your right are green unripe cherries. You can pick those, you could process them. They're not gonna taste nearly as good as the ones on the left, which are ripe yellow fruits. Now, most fruits of coffee, when they ripen, they ripen red. Just so happens that this particular variety, when it ripens, ripens yellow. We will come back to these in a bit, but I will pull them aside. All right, so we have to harvest the ripe cherries or sort out all the cherries that we harvest so that by the time we drink them, they are mostly from the ripe selections. There is a class of coffee where you're drinking the fruits that have gone overripe, and I'm going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. So we need to, we now have these fruits, we pick them off the tree, but as you can see, this fruit is very different from this roasted bean. So we have to, as I mentioned, get the seed out and deal with some more of these layers. So there's an outer layer of the coffee fruit. Underneath that is a really sticky, sweet, quite delicious actually mucilage layer. Underneath that, which is hard to see, is a pale parchment layer. It's very sort of thick papery parchment layer. And under that is a very super thin layer called the silver skin, which you can't really see on my green seeds, unfortunately. And underneath that, we have the seed. So get off all these layers and dry it down or dry it down, get off all the layers. There's a bunch of ways that we can process the cherry. And by process, I mean, remove all the layers and dry it down. And how you choose to do that has an influence on taste. Now I'm gonna talk about three major variations that you're probably gonna find in the marketplace. So the first in the historically oldest one was people picked the ripe fruits and they just dried it down on the side. And as it dried down, it turned dark and it shriveled up. And then once it dried down enough, they removed all the layer. We call that fruit dried process or natural process, the dry process. And when you process the coffee that way intentionally, it tends to pick up a very red fruit flavor experience. The process of drying it in the fruit has a definitive influence on the taste. And it's very consistency, consistently sort of jammy red fruit berry maybe sort of almost alcoholic with a bit of a hint of that. It depends on all sorts of things, but general trend. So that's probably the oldest way. Another way is to squeeze, as you saw, it was very easy for me to do this. It's just gently squeeze the fruit, the seeds pop out, and you can dry down the seeds with that sticky mucilage layer on, and then dry it all together. 
once that's all dry, you can then use a machine to remove all the parts. That will have a, also a definitive influence on the taste. It tends to be a little sweeter, a little more complex than the next version, which I probably should have started there, huh? So we can dry it down with the whole fruit on. We can dry it down with just the sticky mucilage and the parchment layer on. Or we can squeeze out the fruit to get the seeds. We can soak these in water overnight and that will ferment off the sticky mucilage, uh, naturally occurring bacteria, or now a new trend in coffee is to spike it, spike your fermentation tank with bacteria or yeast, usually yeast, I suppose. And that will remove the mucilage overnight. Uh, we also have machines that you can use to sort of scrape it together and scrape off that mucilage layer. And once a mucilage layer is removed, you can dry it down. So if you do it that way, where you remove the mucilage and then dry it down with just the parchment layer on, what happens is you get the, the essence of the coffee, if you will, the identity of the coffee. This way of processing the cherry has the least influence on the final taste. It clearly has an influence, and if you change yeast that you use, or you uh, scrape it off, or you don't scrape it off, and maybe how you dry it or how well you dry it, I mean, these will all have an influence on the taste. But relative to leaving the skin on, the fruit, leaving the mucilage on, and taking it all off, taking it all off is the purest sense of what the coffee might taste like. Now it's possible the coffee might taste terrible, no matter how you do this, right? We have these things that happened already that are gonna influence the taste. So these things don't make coffee better, how you process it, it just influences, it changes the taste. And a farmer might choose that based on a number of ideas. Once you have this dried fruit, this dried seed, or dried combination. We still have to get all the layers off and there are machines that do that. And when that all happens, we get these green beans. And these green beans are not all created equal at this point. We're still, right, just after harvesting, just after drying. There are seeds that might be broken. There are seeds that might've been infested with an insect or a pest or a disease, or they're genetically warped in some way. There's all kinds of things that maybe aren't gonna make the best cup of coffee. So the last thing that's gonna happen generally before it gets to the consumer side of things is that we're gonna sort these out. And there's a bunch of ways of sorting it and sorting it doesn't make the coffee taste better. It's in a sense just removing the bad stuff. So what you're left with tastes as good as it's gonna be. That's the idea anyways. All right, that is everything that's gonna happen before it reaches say the consuming side of things. This is generally where coffee goes from a producing country which tends to happen in a developing country or a third world country, the older terminology. And once it's a green bean and stable, that's when it's packed and shipped and moves around the world. So green coffee is the coffee of commerce. Up to this point, most consumers don't have a lot of options with what to do with it. You, if you're a roaster, you get to select which ones you have, but then you have to process it. But an at-home consumer, you don't even get to generally worry about roasting. You just get to get the roasted stuff. But roasting is really important. So of course we have to talk about that. So we're gonna leave the farm, leave production, and come to what you might find down the street from you, at a local cafe, a local roastery, things that you have better option, more likely to engage with. Of course, most of you viewers I'm expecting are in Hawaii. So you have a real blessing here because you can, if you want, go to a farm. You can call up a farmer, you can visit. You can engage on this whole farm side of things. But you really have to make an effort to do that outside of your normal routine. Whereas this other stuff probably is not so complicated. So before I talk about roasting, I just want to warn you, I'm going to turn on the water kettle because we are going to brew some coffee. It's going to make a little hissing sound, but that just means that we can all get our mouths watering for delicious freshly brewed coffee. Okay, so let's talk about roasting. We have these green seeds, which are perfectly okay to nibble on, but you don't want to. They taste terrible. They taste nothing like coffee. They're sort of a magical process that takes this green bean from this thing to the roasted bean that we know. And I say magical, but it's not magical. It's all very interesting, very complicated chemistry. The reality is we know extremely little about that chemistry. A green bean maybe has three to 500 chemicals in it, but the roasted bean has uh, hundreds more that are in the bean and then well over a thousand volatiles, chemicals that fly off the bean, that evaporate, the, the smell, if you will, and all the things that make that up and all the things that make it up that we don't smell. Roasted coffee is very complicated chemically and it gets complicated because of roasting. So it's a bit of a black box. We know certain major chemical reactions that happen. 
we know that there are certain things that we want to have in there we don't want to have in there but we don't have any simple easy to use chemical markers that say oh this is good coffee or not this coffee We're just coffee science is not that sophisticated yet but we know roasting is hugely important and there's two parts of roasting that um, we can wrap our heads around that are easy enough to access. So the first one is sort of how we roast, the, the roast profile and how we get there. So coffee can be roasted very simply. You take some heat, you take some coffee beans, bam, you roast coffee. And it's gonna taste great. And if you're not used to fresh coffee, it's gonna taste really good. But we can manipulate how you go from the green seed to the roasted seed. We can manipulate the temperature of heat that we add. We can manipulate how we add the heat, what kind of roaster we use. And we can manipulate how, uh, how long it takes to get there. So you might have one roast level, a certain brown color, but by manipulating time and temperature, you might get there through different pathways. And that has an influence on taste. And this is sort of one of the things that you know, makes a roaster stand out from other roasters. Because one coffee roasted by different roasters will taste differently because of this ability to manipulate the roast bean. And it's not that there's one right answer, like one roaster is better than another at the end of the day per se, but you might align yourself with a particular roaster because you like their style. And understanding that they're doing that intentionally is sort of nice. It means that they're crafting and they care about what's going on. And while we don't know and they don't know about the magical details and the scientific nuances of what's going on, they have an experience that says, I know I like it when I do these things and I'm gonna keep doing that thing because that replication, that's important. And that's an, it's a taste idea I wanna be consistent with. So roast profiling, not something most people get to manipulate at all. And really, to be honest, you know, different roasters have their own, own way of doing it, but the consumer is not gonna have a lot of opportunity to have an influence on that. I suppose if you find a roaster who's really engaged in conversation, they might listen and engage you and talk and you might be able to influence their ideas. But that's really like deep down the dark rabbit hole of coffee, which I encourage everybody to go down, don't get me wrong. But I accept that not everybody has spent their life engaging in coffee like I have. So it's okay, it's all right. Just drink your coffee and enjoy it. All right, the other important part of roasting that is very accessible to all of us and probably one of the most mysterious things, even though it's the most basic, is how dark is that roast level? So we start with this green seed and we don't have to end at any particular roast level. We can manipulate that quite a lot. So the short version is the longer you roast coffee or the hotter you roast coffee, the darker it's gonna get. Now there's no right answer for what the roast level should be. We know very distinctly there's a pattern with roasting coffee, how dark it gets and the sort of things we might taste. So let me talk about this continuum of changes. The most basic of course is the color. Coffee roasting starts out sort of a tan, brownish color and it gets darker brown, darker brown, darker brown. It can go all the way to black. By the time it gets to black, though well, maybe that's a bit too much for most people because that really starts to taste roasty. So let's start with the roasty flavor. A light roasted coffee is gonna taste a lot like the identity of the coffee. Whatever that coffee might taste like, whether it tastes just like coffee or whether it tastes like fruits and flowers, whether it has acidity or no acidity. Whatever the potential is in that coffee bean, you're gonna be most, it will be most pronounced at a lighter roast. As it roasts darker, those complexities and nuances will diminish and the process of roasting will increase. By the process of, of roasting, I mean cooking, right? The more you cook anything, whether it be tofu or steak or broccoli, if you keep cooking it, keep cooking it, it's eventually gonna taste burnt. But at some point before it's burnt, it tastes like being cooked. It might taste woody, roasty, smoky, charry, Coffee's no different. There's a lot of carbon in here. So the more you roast it, the more it's gonna have a bread or woody experience to it that reminds you of things that are overcooked. But overcooked is a, not a bad thing, right? Some people really like that experience. I'm not judging here. I'm just trying to explain that a really light roast doesn't have any of that taste of roastiness, whereas a really dark roast will have a lot of it. So one continuum, not roastiness to a lot of roastiness. Sort of related to that, that a really light roasted coffee isn't really bitter. There's gonna be a small trace of bitterness, but if everything up to this point that's produced the coffee has been done pretty well, it won't be that bitter. Bitterness starts to show up when we roast coffee darker and darker. Bitterness is not bad, some people love it. There are many cultures that consume bitter melon, which is an incredibly bitter food. 
Nothing wrong with bitter. Lighter coffee is not so bitter, darker coffee is more bitter. One of the things people tend to confuse bitterness with is acidity. We all know acidity because we've all eaten oranges and lemons and vinegar and all sorts of things that we rate on a pH scale, measurements of how tangy it is. A lot of people don't like acidity in their coffee because we're not familiar with it. We're not used to our coffee being bright and tingly and reminding us of things like lemons. That's okay. At a lighter roast, acidity, if it's inherently in the coffee, we most pronounced. As you get darker, that acidity is gonna be diminished. Now I wanna make a distinction in acidity just for your common experience of, of thinking about it. Right, acidity is sort of the amount of, uh, chemically, it's the amount of hydrogen ions that we're experiencing. But that is meaningless in a human taste experience. I think the best way to talk about it is think about licking an orange or eating an orange or having some vinegar on your salad. There's a tangy, there's a brightness, and if it's just a little bit, it's acidity, right? We talk about it as acidity. The way we talk about orange being a little acid. We talk about lemons being acid too, but we talk about it being really acid, so much that it, it's sour. We have a new word for it. We're talking about the same thing, the acids that make oranges bright and tangy and the acids that make the lemon bright and tangy is the exact same chemical compound, but there's more of it in the lemon. So much that we tend not to like it straight, and we say that's sour. So when we talk about coffee, we talk about both acidity and sour. But we talk about sour, we talk about you know, the taste of coffee we don't really like. Uh, oh, this is fermented sour. This is not a flavor I want or expect to be in my coffee. Versus acid, which is at the right dose, the right amount, can be quite pleasant. Now that amount, that quite pleasant, will vary from person to person. So what is desirable for me might be sour for you. And this happens all the time. No right answer. Just trying to help you frame that someone might serve you a coffee that's very bright and they think it's delicious. That's just why they're giving it to you. And it may not work for you. That doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean they don't like you. It just means that you guys want different things. Now, if it tastes like fermented gym socks, then you're right. You probably don't want to be drinking that. And that's a sour and undesirable all around together. I'm going to take a little break. Quickly start grinding our coffee because we're going to start brewing soon. Don't mind the purr of the grinder. All right, so we have these things that change as roasting changes, right? We have increased in acidity, we have increased in bitterness, increased in roastiness. Uh, we have a decrease in complexity. And the last thing that we have is uh, an increase in body or thickness or viscosity. Right, if you take one coffee at different roast levels and you brew it, it's going to taste heavier, thicker, more like whole milk than skim milk, if you will, or red wine to white wine. The body increases as we roast a bit more. If you roast a lot, a lot, a lot, till it gets really dark, then it will taper off a bit. So I know a lot of you viewers were excited about the Tasty Kit and you purchased that. And I want to talk about that just for a moment because you've got it and I think it was a cool idea. So what we did for the tasting kit was we took one coffee, in this case a coffee grown in Wailua here on our North Shore, and roasted three different ways. Now this roast discrepancy, this, this gradient, is not humongous. Especially if you compare right, these first three to this last one, this is very very dark, this is sort of medium dark, and these look pretty light to medium. We did that intentionally. As much as a really dark roast has, it really hits you over the head, dark roasty flavor, and it tastes really, really different from the others. I wanted you to have a window into specialty coffee and how specialty coffee people see and experience dark roasting. Because at some point, people in specialty coffee, and I mean people who really are passionate about coffee such that they read about it and they only want stuff that is, well, it tends to be expensive, tends to be very complex. They don't want the flavor of roasting to get in the way of the flavor of the coffee. So to them, a dark roast is not that dark by generic standards. So your tasty kit has three different coffees, one coffee roasted three ways, but it's a small gradient. I encourage you to really carefully think about what you're tasting when you drink it. There's no right answer. Like I said in your notes, what I taste, it might be different from what you taste and that's perfectly okay. But imagine if you've drunk your coffees already or when you drink them and you remember this, this is the darkest one you were given, 
the trends that you're tasting, the trends I described will be more pronounced as the coffee gets darker and darker. All right, I think that is enough about roasting itself. After we roast, we can start brewing. But there tends to be some time between when a coffee is roasted and when a coffee is brewed. And that can be really important. The shorthand for a way of thinking about that time is how fresh the coffee is or how stale the coffee is, right? They're this different ideas from the same coin. The minute coffee is roasted, and it, you know, the minute it goes in the roaster, it starts changing. As the roast is partway done, it starts giving off a lot of gases, right? This green seed loses a lot of mass and it, that mass goes away as is, is gas. That's, that's the result of chemical reactions. But you're familiar with this. You've smelled coffee before, right? You have squeezed a bag, round coffee, smelled it. We all know coffee smells like something and hopefully that smell is yummy to you. That smell are gases that are coming off the seeds and the beans or the particles, whatever stage you're at. And those things are important to our taste experience. As more and more of those leave, there's less and less of those things that we're tasting. Now, the longer coffee ages from roasting, doesn't, it doesn't go bad in the sense that it makes us unhealthy. You're not gonna get sick from coffee that's been roasted a year ago, in most cases. However, a lot of those things that were once in the beans have now left. It's a natural process of, of chemicals leaving the seed. So a way of thinking about freshness is how much of that stuff, those chemicals are still in the seed and get it into your cup. A second part of coffee freshness is the chemicals that are in the beans that don't ever leave through volatile escape. So we have this wonderful thing that keeps us all alive called oxygen. Absolutely necessary for humans. If we don't have it, we die pretty fast. And it doesn't kill us, it keeps us alive. But it's a very reactive compound. And oxygen will react with things in coffee seeds and change them, change them in such a way that it makes it less desirable for us when we drink it. So we talk about freshness, right? This idea that here's this thing we like to drink and that it changes over time. It changes over time because volatiles are leaving and because oxygen is influencing the chemical makeup of the seed itself. So what is fresh coffee? Well, I don't have an answer for you because what I think of as fresh coffee is gonna be different. I mean, bear in mind, I'm a coffee freak. Like I've studied coffee in school. I've made it my career. I've drunk a lot of coffee. I think about taste. Like, this is what I do. So I might taste things that you might not taste and I'm gonna care about things that you may not care about. So for me, fresh just might be a coffee that was roasted within two weeks. For a lot of people, it's probably four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks. If you go to a grocery store and buy coffee, that coffee has been sitting around for months and months before it even gets to the shelf, never mind before you get it home and drink it. And I'm not saying that fresh coffee is better than a stale coffee. They're gonna be different. There's gonna be more experience, more intensity, more oomph to a coffee that's fresher. So you now have this idea of, oh, coffee has a freshness. How do we maintain that? Because you're obviously not gonna go to the roaster, watch him roast it, get it out of the roaster and then take it home. That's just not practical. And for a lot of people, you order online, so of course there'll be a delay. So how can we preserve it as much as possible so that by the time coffee gets to you, it's as most intense as it's gonna be, that the potential is there. Well, how do we combat those two things? We can prevent oxygen from getting into the coffee by sealing it into an airtight container. So I have two of these containers just for us to look at. Most commonly is a foil bag. Uh, they're much prettier than this normally these days. It's airtight, it's watertight, nothing gets through. Great, no oxygen gets in. Um, could of course also put it in some kind of a jar or other object that is sealed and free from the environment. This is the most common. So that's how we keep oxygen out. Of course, that means that people need to have as little oxygen go into the bag as possible. The other thing that we need to do is, it's great to seal up your coffee so it's not interacting with oxygen, but it's still producing that gas, right? That gas is leaving no matter what happens. And if you seal up an object that is giving off a lot of gas, that gas is gonna build a lot of pressure and it might blow up that package. It's happened. This is something we've learned in the coffee industry. We've, we've stopped patching, packing it in ways that's gonna cause that kind of explosive packaging. One of great innovations in coffee with these little 
one-way valves that you find in most bags of coffee that you might see anywhere, whether it's from a, a local roaster or grocery store coffee. It's a little valve, little plastic valve that lets oxygen not enter, lets nothing enter, right? Remember, we want to keep all that out. So I said it's one way. It's not one way in, it's one way out. So all these gases that are produced can escape without things coming in. You know, if you go to find a bag of coffee, that's why you can squeeze it and some gas comes out of this little button, little puka, this little one-way valve, gives you a chance to smell what's going on. There's a manufacturer, I just have to explain this, who makes these spectacular mason jar lids, um, stainless steel, the silicon rim inside, and it has a beautiful one-way valve on it. Super cool. People are trying to maintain the flexibility to do what we want to do with our quality in ways that are as least impactful to the environment as possible. So I think it's spectacular. All right, so that's freshness. I'm gonna start brewing the coffee because now we're gonna start talking about brewing coffee and the things in brewing that we can manipulate to change the flavor. Now, you are gonna want me to say, oh, you're gonna talk about all these things, Sean, and I wanna know how, if I manipulate that one thing, how it influences the flavor. And I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that for two reasons. One reason is, I just don't know that high level of detail. And part of that is because different coffees respond differently. And these things don't necessarily work in isolation. You might change one parameter, but you tend to also have to take, change one or two others to accommodate that. Brewing coffee is, well, very simple. Um, there are a few things to pay attention to and they all interact, which is cool, right? There's still a sort of magical black box about coffee. And as someone who spent his lifetime studying coffee from an academic and scientific perspective, sort of charming that we don't have all the answers yet. I, I sort of like that. Although maybe if you asked me 20 years ago, I would have felt differently about it. So let me list through all the things we're gonna talk about and then we'll just plug through them. And I'm gonna use my little cheat sheet off to the side. That's where I'm looking is my guide list here. All right, we're gonna talk about big picture, like right, the brew method, right? Different ways of brewing coffee influence the taste. But the reason they do that is because we can change how much coffee to water we use, the brew ratio. We can influence grind size, water temperature, water quality, agitation, pressure, contact time, filter type, and maybe container type. So even though I've written about this a lot, and even though I've talked about this a lot, I'm, I still have to cheat, I'm sorry, because that's nine things and I don't have that good a memory. Forgive me. All right, so brew method. There's sort of three major categories of how we brew coffee. The most common one is we take hot water, we pour it on top of a bed of coffee. You might use a machine to do that, like a Braun or Mr. Coffee. You might do it yourself, right? You heat the water and then you pour it over. And basically we're letting gravity move water through the bed of coffee. So let's call it the gravity fed method. One major category. Another category is full immersion, where you take your coffee, you take your water, you mix them together, you let them sit together for a few minutes. They're fully in contact the whole time, right? With gravity fed, you have this you know, unit of water that slowly trickles down and then leaves. But with full immersion, they're together the whole time. Full immersion, the most common method people are familiar with is French press. This is called a soda and soft brew. I think it's way cooler and more fun and a little sexier. It has a metal filter you just stick inside, coffee, water, you come back, and then you just pour it out kind of like a French press. Same idea in principle, small differences. Third method, which if you ever go to cafes, you're probably quite familiar with, is to use high pressure to extract the um, flavors from the coffee beans. We tend to think of that as espresso, right? The, the pressure of our atmosphere is defined as one atmosphere or one bar of pressure. So when I'm brewing coffee here, it's one atmosphere of pressure. An espresso machine increases that from one atmosphere to nine atmospheres or even more. So instead of gentle, it's really pushing down and that has a big influence on the flavor. But high pressure is general category because there are other units, this is an arrow press, for example, where you put the water and the coffee in, in this little syringe type object and you add pressure. It's not quite as high level of pressure as an espresso machine, but it's not one atmosphere like you have with your drip. So three major categories. And those three major things will influence the taste. But within those three things, right, there's all these other ideas for us to worry about. Now, I wanna say outright, there's no best way to brew coffee. Not one of these methods 
is better than the other within gravity fed within full immersion. There's no ideal toy or ideal brewer. They're different, they're different for different reasons and why you like one over the other is gonna different, could be different. These are things that I really love. It's are out of my house. I have a few more toys at home. There's lots of ways of making coffee. No right answer. All of them have merits of their own right. All right, so let's talk about some of these things. I'm gonna talk about it slightly out of order from when I listed it because I wanna start brewing because I've been talking a while, I'm getting thirsty and I hope you're all thirsty drinking coffee. So let's move to the coffee part, a really sensory part of this experience. But first, before we can drink, we must make. So I said there are nine things that we can manipulate. But before we even go there, so I start brewing, I wanna go back to freshness. Because when you're brewing your coffee, or if you're brewing in a way that you can see it, I should say, if you stick in the coffee, electric coffee pot, you won't see this. But I said there's a lot of gas in coffee. And gas does not like to be in water. It really doesn't like to be in hot water. So I'm gonna brew this coffee, I'm gonna add a little bit of water. And most of the time we don't think of watching coffee brew as being very exciting. But a really fresh coffee, which has a lot of gas, we're gonna add the water and the gas is gonna escape because it doesn't wanna be in the water. And the bed of coffee is gonna go from this flat layer to a sort of a bubble. We call it a bloom. There's nothing magical about the bloom. It's just the gas escaping and pushing everything up. We're gonna see bubbles because bubbles get caught in the water and then some of the oils that are in the coffee. The reason I mentioned the bloom at all is because it's a very trendy thing, but it's a really great reflection of the coffee being fresh. And by fresh in this instance, I mean closer to the roasting date because there's more gases there, right? If you brew a coffee that's six months from roasting, there won't be that many gases because they've all left. So first I'm gonna show you our bed of coffee that's just flat and dry. And then I'm gonna put it back on my scale. So I'm gonna weigh how much water I add. We'll get to that in a moment. I'm gonna add just a little bit of water to wet the grounds. And you can see my flat bed is now bubbling up. It's sort of coning. And we're just giving an opportunity for the coffee to release some of that gas. And there's a theory about why that's important. And that theory is you have a particle of coffee and you have water coming down. Now, as soon as that water hits the coffee, the gas escapes and creates sort of an air bubble around it. Well, that means the next drop of water is gonna hit that air bubble and go around the coffee particle instead of through it. If you're doing that, you're not really extracting the coffee. So this is sort of a pre-wetting to make the coffee more receptacle receptive, sorry, to, to taking in the water and extracting more efficiently. Is it really that important to taste? That's certainly up for debate. If you go online and look for commentary about blooming versus not blooming, and I've done it myself in my home kitchen, right? I've done a bloom versus a not bloom. There is a slight taste in, in there's a slight difference in the taste. It's not huge. It's not better or worse, but it's different, right? It's a lateral shift. I think the bloom is fun and pretty, so that's why I tend to do it when I brew this way. You know, it, as a scientist, I still appreciate a little artfulness in my life, and this is a way I can get some of that artfulness. All right, so now let's talk about all these things that I can do to change what the coffee is going to taste like. The first one, that's why I have a scale, is the brew ratio. How much coffee am I using and how much water am I using? There's no ideal answer for this. Officially, there's a group called the Specialty Coffee Association. And they recommend to start, if you will, one part coffee to 18 parts water by weight. So in my case, I weighed out 50 grams of coffee, which is what you saw me grind. And I'm gonna add 900 grams of water, which is something none of us wrap our heads around, right? We usually do scoops and we sort of estimate and we use volumetric measurements. It's totally fine. But I'm a fanatic and I don't want that level of uncertainty. I want precision. So I weigh out my coffee, I weigh out my water and I have a little kitchen skill to help me do it. Now I said one to 18 is a place to start. I also say that because I am partial to it. Most coffees I drink, I like in that range. But you will find lots of people who go stronger, one to 17, one to 16, one to 15, even one to 14 occasionally. And at that point, sometimes people add back in water to, to redilute it. Um, people tend not to go much weaker, one to 19, but there's no, there's no right answer. You're gonna find what you like to do. 
especially it's going to depend on how you are brewing it, what method you have and what other things you might manipulate. So my starting point is how much coffee to water I'm using. And when we talk about coffee strength, by the way, this is really what we're talking about. Strength in coffee is how much coffee is in the water that we're pouring through, right? Most of coffee that we drink is water. It's not like we're consuming the beans whole. We're extracting a little bit of stuff. We end up extracting about 20% of what's in the bean and the liquid itself tends to be in the range of 1.8 to 2.2% coffee. The rest is water. But that range is big and we can manipulate that. And the more coffee beans that you use, the more stuff you're gonna extract, the stronger your coffee will be. That said, a lot of people talk about strength in terms of roast level, dark coffee strong. And I would encourage you not to think of dark coffee as strong, but really intense and intense in the roasty, smoky, woody, knock you over the head with a club kind of flavor experience. All right, so I always start with brew strength and then start manipulating things from there. The easiest next thing to worry about with brew strength, after brew strength for me is grind size, right? We have these little particles we're trying to pull water out of. A perfect, sorry, we're trying to use water to pull flavor out of them. The smaller the particle, the more efficient, the quicker it will be to pull things out of the coffee. The bigger it is, the slower it will happen, right? Because the bigger the particle, the longer it will take for water to get in and out. In a perfect world, every piece of coffee, every grinded ground particle would be the exact same size. That's never gonna happen. I don't care how fancy your equipment is. I don't care what secret tricks you have, right? There are cafes now that are freezing their coffee in the hopper in the hopper, because we know that freezing helps unify the particle size. And there's really great machines that do a great job at limiting that range of particle sizes, but except there's gonna be variation. But the more uniform it is, the more uniform your cup will be from time to time, and the more ideal or paradigmatically ideal experience you're gonna get. So, First, we want to sort of make sure all those particle sizes are as close to the same as possible. Then we have to think about how big we want it. And how big we want that particle to be, here's uh, some examples of different ground, grind sizes. How big we want that to be is gonna depend on what we want the end taste to be like. It's gonna depend on how long it's gonna to take to brew the coffee. It might depend on the filter, which has an influence on other things, how long it takes to brew, for example. So these things aren't independent, as I mentioned, right? How I choose the grind setting is gonna depend on other things that are gonna happen. So you're gonna pick a strength, you're gonna pick a brew method, and you wanna create the right flavor to come out of it. So you're gonna pick a certain grind size, but that grind size with that brew method and everything else is gonna change how long it takes for the water and the coffee to interact. So if I had made a really big particle grind with this particular brewing that we're doing right now, the water would fall right through because the pieces are big and they're not being stopped by going through them. The smaller the particle grind, the slower it'll take because it's just more compactness of the grounds. It'll just take longer for the water to trickle through. How much time they're in contact together is gonna influence how much is extracted. So the particle size and how much time they're in contact are interrelated. You manipulate one, you're gonna manipulate the other. So they're not truly independent, but you have to keep them both in mind because you can use one to offset the other in an emergency situation. I've done this many times. Oh, I totally ground on the wrong brew meth, brew, wrong grind setting. How do I deal with that without throwing it out? Knowing where you wanna get is more important than how you get there. And I'll come back to that at the end because it's a really important idea. So we have now talked about brew, Strength, we've talked about grind size, we've talked about contact time. Let's talk about water temperature. I don't know if you've noticed, um, I have this water kettle here, which has a nice beautiful water spout, and that just gives me control over the brewing. But it also, you can't see it unfortunately with, you can't see it without the kettle on here, but there's a thermometer in here and it monitors the, and manages the temperature for me. So water temperature. There's no right answer. It's gonna interact with everything else. Sorry to keep saying that, but that's true. If you're doing hot water, 195 to 205. All right, this is almost done. We can drink soon. I'll just leave it there. All right, I'm gonna sort of 
move through the rest because there tend to be less common ways to, of dealing with things. So water quality. This is 98 or so percent water. If the water doesn't taste good, the coffee's not gonna taste good. There's a lot of interesting science and conversation going on with water quality right now. The really, really rough rule of thumb is if your tap water tastes really good, you'll probably be fine. If it doesn't, go for bottled water. I mean, there's a whole other level of, of water quality we can talk about, but let's not go there. Not here, not right now, because we have other things to get through. Agitation. If you add, if you're trying to dissolve some sugar in water or salt in water, you just add the sugar and you add the water and you let it sit there, it will dissolve eventually. But if you stir it and stir it a lot, it's gonna dissolve much faster because that agitation gets particles more in touch with the water and it will dissolve faster. So we can do that with coffee too. So what I could have done while brewing was to stir this, it would have sped things up. If I were doing a full immersion, I may have stirred it a little bit to speed things up. We talked a little bit about pressure already, right? Espresso uses high pressure to force water through the bean. That's gonna pull out a lot more stuff because of the high pressure than if we don't do that. And one of the things to note about pressure is that it tends to highlight acidity. So if a coffee is inherently acidy, it'll taste much more so if it's brewed under high pressure. This is one of the reasons why espresso roasts and espresso blends tend to exist. And a darker roast for espresso, as I mentioned, minimizes acidity. So have a coffee with a lot of brightness, roasting it darker, going through an espresso machine will taste a little more desirable than most people. And we blend to balance out the acidity and other flavors that might come from a single coffee. And we blend them for espresso to make a more uniform experience. All right, just two more things on our list. Filter type and container type. So there are lots of different materials that filters can be made from. Paper, metal, cloth. They have different hole sizes, different paper thicknesses. They're all gonna play a role, right? This paper has gone from white to brown because it's captured things that didn't make it into the cup. This filter, which is metal, it's gonna let many more of those things through. What your material is made of will also influence the rate of flow of water or the brew time, so just keep in mind. Will also um, influence how much particulate is in there, right? The paper not only catches the oils, it catches a lot of the really fine dust particles, whereas the metal one captures nothing. It lets those really fine dusty particles through. Okay, the last thing we're gonna talk about is container type. Plastic, metal, glass, ceramic. Modern manufacturing has really nailed most of these different materials. And I don't find a lot of differences in coffee flavor depending on what they're used, depending on what is used, but something to be aware of. Some people are partial to glass and ceramic because it's safer or they feel like it's safer. Nothing wrong with that. I'm sure most plastic things or metal things don't influence taste, at least I haven't experienced it lately. That's what I'm gonna leave in your hands. All right, I'm gonna have a little bit of coffee. Even though I speak fast, I still drink a lot of coffee. Not that it speeds me up, but I just really love this stuff. I hope that you all have been drinking some coffee because what fun is it to have a coffee class and not drink coffee? So Sean, well, thank you, first of all, for going through um, all of that. Very, very insightful. Learned a few things, of course, myself, even from um, talking to you before this. Um, you know, first, maybe a simple question is um, from Emily was, what was the French press like pot called? Again, the white one you have there. Emily, thank you for such an easy starter question. So um, this pot is called a Soden soft brew. Uh, it's a, I believe a Swedish company. They are available in the US. They took a break for a while, but they're back now. Really stylish and beautiful. And they have all kinds of colors and shapes now. Soden soft brew. All right, we need to wait a minute, folks. One of the, our wonderful- Can you guys hear me now? Assistant had a little battery okay. troubles. So I think our battery's low, so Great. we'll switch it out, but let me ask a question first while we still have some battery life. Um, so you mentioned about um, grind size um, for the different methods. Do, uh, Dan is asking, do particular beans or roasts work better using particular brew methods? That's a great question. So does the bean determine how you might wanna brew your coffee? I think the answer is yes. I certainly believe that the brew method and the 
various ways we're going to manipulate it are going to change how the coffee tastes. I'm not going to say that dark roast should always be brewed under espresso or under a drip. I'm not going to say that a really complex floral coffee should always be done with a paper filter. Not because it doesn't have an influence, it does. But I, I really believe there's no right answer. What I want, what you want might be different. So I think over time you might find that coffees that you want to highlight certain traits, whether it be acidity or body, you might choose different pathways than others to maintain those or to highlight those. But, you know, if you were to brew one coffee under all the different toys at this table, and then all the other ones that you might find, they're going to taste different. They're going to taste better? I don't think so. But they'll taste different. And that's up to you to decide which one of those is the best. A question from Norma is, what type of grinder do you use? Oh, if only I got some benefit from product placement. So I am a huge fan of the Baratza family of grinders. Here, I'll just spin this around for you. Um, Baratza has been making grinders for, oh, I've known about them for at least 20 years and a little bit longer, I think. They've got a huge range of things, mostly for home users, also for um, high, you know, cafe settings where you don't need a high throughput machine. These are great for gazillions of reasons. Um, one of the, the base level important things is that it's a burr grinder. We talk about grinding coffee, we have two major methods. We have um, metal blade grinders, which is what a lot of people are familiar with. They're really small box compartments. There's a metal blade with two little wings and the blade just spins around. You put your coffee in, you whirl it around, and it you know, takes like 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and you have your grounds. That's the really affordable way to do it, but it is the way that gives you less consistent grind size. Because right, once a bean is hit in that blade, it can be hit many times whereas some other bean piece might not be hit as many times. So the size gradient is bigger. Burr grinders are just like spice mills or pepper mills. You have two burrs made of steel or ceramic or something that are set distance apart and they rotate, one rotates around the other, the bean falls. And as it grinds up, the more smaller it gets, the more smaller, hello, I live in Hawaii. The, as the particle gets smaller, it can fit through that space between the two burrs it goes to a compartment below, and that sort of helps regulate the particle size. Um, there's lots of burr grinders. They're different and great for different reasons. I will always try to sell you a Baratza because I think they have a lot of great things about them. Particularly, you can replace every part inside. And that means, you know, I've had this grinder for, I don't know, I think I bought it as a refurbished, and I think it's a decade old still. And I replace things all the time. So that's a great environmental reason to stick with a Baratza. But they're, they're stupendous. We'll, we'll cut the portion of this clip and send it to them so they can send you a check. Um, a question for Mark similarly, and I know you kind of already addressed this, but if you do use a smaller grinder that isn't automated, you know, how long should you pulse it for or in terms of grinding it down? Oh, so how's the best way to use a metal blade grinder? That's a tricky question because it's going to depend on what brew method you're going to use. I would say more useful idea than how big the particle should be because that's really hard to describe without showing you lots of different particle sizes for your brew method is how you might try to get the particle sizes more uniform. And I have this belief, I've never proven it or tested it, that if you're grinding one of those things, if you shake it up and down a little bit, you help stir things a bit more, you're gonna help even out that grind distribution. But here's a rule of thumb for particle size. The longer the coffee and water are sitting together, so for example, in a full immersion, the longer that is, the bigger you want the pieces to be. The shorter the amount of time, so for an espresso and AeroPress, the finer you want them to be. Particle size and contact time are highly interrelated. So you have to balance those two things together. And a question from, um, well, from Wes and from Ann is, you know, you mentioned a little bit about storing and the valves. Um, so one question is, is there a particular, a better way to store in Hawaii, you know, given the humidity and things like that? And, so to base upon what you said about gases being released, are airtight containers not good for storing beads since they don't have a valve? That is a stupendous question. So I'm gonna expand the answer a little bit to, to talk about for the practical realities of storing coffee and what happens after roasting. So at the roaster, but they, they roast the coffee, it's finished, it's cooled down, they need to package it, right? They're gonna package it in one of these bags, almost certainly it's gonna be in a bag. It's gonna be sealed and maybe they evacuate the oxygen. Maybe they flush it with nitrogen to evacuate more of the oxygen. 
but they're going to seal it up and you're going to get it. Now, once you open that bag, all of that hard work is now done. It's done its purpose, right? You're going to open up the bag and oxygen is going to get in and gas is going to, more gas will get out. There's been some really interesting research out of the spectacular research group in Zurich that shows if you're going to keep coffee in the bag, it's actually kind of a good idea because the stuff on the bottom is less exposed to the oxygen. So you can just sort of scoop things out of the bag or pour some out and sort of keeps a more secure environment. But those bags are real humbug to work with and they're hard to deal with. And I always put mine into a jar. So I think it's a lot easier. The reality is once you move it into a jar or some other container, right, you've already, you're interacting it with the world around it. And I'm gonna pour coffee in here and there's gonna be oxygen in there because I'm just gonna close the lid. So your coffee's gonna change, like, except that's okay. Except that today is different than it was yesterday. It'll be different tomorrow. A little bit, maybe not so much you'll taste it, but over a week or two, you might notice that shift. So first thing I recommend is be okay with that. Um, if it's really a problem, buy less at a time and drink it faster. So in Hawaii, we talk about our horrible humidity and I live in the back of Palolo. I get lots of rain, which is great for my garden, but not so great for my food in my house. So yeah, I always seal everything, every coffee in an airtight container as soon as I can. But remember, right, every day I open it. The extended question, which I'm sure some of you are probably having, is what about the refrigerator and the freezer? And this is an area of coffee that is really up for debate right now. And there is a lot of debate going on. I tend not to have a lot of coffee on hand that I even need to freeze it or store it in some other way than just in a jar, in a drawer on the counter. But cold temperatures reduce chemical reactions. That's why we store food in them, so that critters don't grow and have a lot of activity. Same will be true for coffee. Gas will evacuate the beans slower and the oxygen will react with it much slower if you chill it down. In theory, there's no problem doing this. In fact, I mentioned earlier that some cafes are encasing their grinders in freezer areas to keep the beans really cold before grinding. Inherently, freezing does no wrong with your coffee. What might be a problem is if you take those beans in and out of the freezer a lot, especially in humid Hawaii, where moisture might get on them and accelerate changes, or when you put it at the freezer, that moisture that's condensed on it creates ice crystals and changes the nature of the coffee. There might be changes that happen with the in and out a lot, and that we might want to avoid. Totally hypothetical, just sort of my scientific educated guess. Nobody seems to know the answer to this, actually. So if you're gonna have coffee for a long time, what I would recommend is if you're gonna store it in the freezer, feel free to do that. Take it out and take it out once. So store enough that you're gonna pull out some and then go through that the next week or whatever it's gonna be. That way it's not going in and out. I know a lot of people in the coffee industry who I really respect and admire who are big believers in freezing a batch of coffee after it's roasted and then pulling it out and using it. It's hard for me to argue with people I trust, so take that for what it's worth. I just wanna note that we are at the hour mark, um, but we do have a lot of great questions. So we're gonna keep going for a little bit. Um, we do have a couple announcements at the end. So especially if you're a Lexus owner, I would encourage you to stay on. But of course, all of you should stay on. I think there's some really great questions that we still have coming. So um, you've already answered one of the questions about freezing, um, but also on kind of the line of uh, chilled or refrigeration is what are your thoughts about cold brew? So lots of ways of making coffee. What about cold brew? And what is cold brew, for those of you who don't know? So most of the time we think about making coffee, we use hot water, and it happens within the course of a few minutes. But there's no reason the water has to be hot. That's just a historical quirk, because it happens efficiently and quickly. We can use cold or room temperature water. And if we're gonna do that, we have to let the coffee and the water brew longer, have to let them sit together longer. So traditionally with cold brew, you mix room temperature water, or you stick in the fridge with the coffee, and you let it sit overnight. 12 hours, 18, 24 hours, you let them brew together. And then you filter it. Then you either have a concentrate or you have this beverage you can drink right away. It's one great way of drinking coffee. You can drink it cold. You can add hot water to the concentrate that's left um, to have hot coffee really quickly. It has become very popular in cafes and in home users. It's a great way to make coffee. I tend not to drink cold coffee. It's just not my preference. So I tend not to make cold brew. I tend not to make iced coffee. I've had really amazingly delicious cold brew coffees, but even in the hot sweltering Hawaiian sun, I just want hot coffee. But if you come, I do a farmer's market booth, if you come visit me, you can get iced coffee, it's delicious. 
If you go to lots of cafes, you can get cold brew coffee. Some cafes you can get coffee that's made via cold brew method and then nitrogen's forced through it. So you get a really creamy, um, bubbly, smooth coffee experience, kind of like a Guinness, but with coffee. Um, there's, there's lots of great ways to make coffee. Cold brew is just one of them. And what is your favorite? Um, well, what is first, what is your, uh, Anne is asking, what is your favorite coffee bean? And Anne and a few others also asked, what is your, your favorite brewing method? Uh, such great questions. And I'm gonna give you such unsatisfying answers. So let's start with the favorite bean part. There's some 50 odd countries that commercially grow coffee in the world. And within each of those countries, there's lots of regions and lots of farms and lots of farmers in different environments growing different varieties in different ways. There's a lot of variation when it comes to coffee. And I am a novelty seeker. I'm not the kind of person who gets one coffee and drinks it all the time or gets one kind of wine or gets one kind of menu item. I always want something different. So I really, I don't have a favorite coffee origin or process. I tend to lean towards complexity, right? I want coffee that tastes like coffee, but other things. And those other things that I gravitate towards more often than not tend to be things that are floral or things that have a sort of a stone fruit, more peachy apricot -y taste experience to them. But sometimes I want something that's red fruit. Sometimes I want chocolate. Sometimes I want just coffee that tastes like coffee. Depends on the mood, the time of day, who I'm with, how I'm brewing. Like there's all kinds of parameters. So uh, that's a, that's a, I hope it's not too unsatisfying, but that's the truth. Brewing method, I'm gonna answer in two ways. I have a three and a half year old daughter. I wake up with her in the mornings. And as much as I would love to brew coffee in some spectacular mechanism, I have a really nice, electric drip machine. Gets the water the right temperature, it works really well. Almost every morning that's what I use because it makes good coffee and it leaves me enough time to interact with my child. If I had all the time in the world, and when I do have all the time in the world, I vacillate between two other methods. I love full immersion. I love the extra body you get from this. I kind of like some of that grittiness that the particulate leaves. I think it's a really, well for me it's a really satisfying experience. I also really love vacuum pots. And I didn't bring one of those to show. The vacuum pot is, of all the, chem, all the coffee ways, all the ways to make coffee, it's the most chemistry, science-y looking one, even more so than the Chemex here. Because you have these two globes, water in one, a coffee in the other, and the water goes up and it brews and it comes back down. It's very showy. But it also does something really unique, which is when you heat the water, almost all the water goes up to brew and there's a full immersion brewing that happens. But some of the water stays down. So when you're done brewing, the coffee, comes down, it's filtered in the middle, and it mixes with that hot water in the bottom. And it dilutes a little bit. And that, it's the only method that does that. And it's kind of like adding some water to scotch. It, it changes it in a way, not better or worse, but it changes it, and I am charmed by that. So electric drip is practical, and then full immersion and uh, vacuum pot are the other two that I use most often. Okay. Um, Great questions. So, Looking at the brew, which the tools you mentioned, one of them is filter. And one of the questions um, that came in was, is there a difference between using a bleached or unbleached filter? Hmm, that's a thoughtful question. So in the paper filter world, we've moved towards really white filters. Sorry, it's one over here, like I started with, which is bleached, not necessarily with bleach anymore. There are other ways of, of whitening it. People have moved away from bleach because that is something that has um, become less desirable. Or you can do a more natural version. They tend to be brown colored. <sighs> I sigh deeply because I really, it, in some cases, the brown filters don't have any impact on taste. But I've definitely had brown filters that to me leave a, a woody, papery taste behind in the coffee. So I tend to avoid them because I don't want that. I want my coffee to taste like coffee, not like wood. So if you notice a woody taste, I would shift away to white filters. I think because coffee filters aren't bleached with chlorine the way they once were, there's not a, a health concern, environmental concern, that it's just a matter of preference at the end of the day or availability, right? Maybe you don't have access to both of them very easily. So if you're concerned about the taste of your brown filters, get some white filters and do a taste test. Brew, you know, brew a double dose that day and, and brew them both and taste it side by side and see if there's an important difference. If there is an important difference, Go with the one you prefer more. If there isn't, stick with the one you like more. 
Sean, a question about store, back to storage is, um, does, and this is from Marty, does light affect bean quality um, in storage? Is dark better or a, you know, a, a glass versus a, a fully closed container? I love that question, Marty, thank you. And I love it because we don't know. <laughs> So the common trope is that light is bad for coffee. It'll, it'll increase staling. If that's true, it's probably gonna be the ultraviolet light coming through. That's gonna be uh, causing more chemical reactions. I think visible light is not gonna be uh, relevant at all because it won't have enough energy to make significant changes. I've done a little bit of, of literature searching to try to suss this out, but I couldn't find anything. And probably because it's not that important idea. Right? If you have your coffee stored inside, you're probably not getting a whole lot of UV light. And, and if you are, it's probably a relatively small amount of change anyways. But we don't really know the answer, so I could be totally wrong. My educated guess is light's not a big deal. I tend to keep coffee in jars in a drawer because it's nicer to look at in the kitchen. Um, but sometimes I'll leave it out on the counter. And, some, and I, I, I do a delivery service for folks here on Oahu. And sometimes I put jars out on their doorsteps and they're gonna get hit for a couple hours by sun. People don't get to them pretty fast. I'm not too worried about it, to be honest. So yes, it might be difference happening, but there's no quantification. And it just seems like such a small difference that it's not one of the things I'm gonna worry about. And, and on that note of storage, Diane is asking, where can one buy a mason jar lid with valve <laughs> that you showed off? Yay. All right, so I am gonna brag about these lids because they're awesome. Um, so the company that makes them is called Trellis and Company. And Trellis and Company doesn't actually sell them. They, they partnered with a, with a seed company called True Leaf Market based in, I think, Salt Lake City. They actually make them not for coffee. They make them for fermenting fruits and vegetables and, and canning operations. But I stumbled upon them and realized this is the perfect thing for coffee. Uh, you, can, you can find it online easily. They're sold through Amazon. Go to the True Leaf Market website. Um, they're super spectacular. Silicon, all silicon, no plastic, all stainless steel, just delightful. You can replace the little bit if it breaks, you know. Can't, can't be more excited about these innovative tools for coffee. So going back to the origination of, of beans and especially here locally, um, you know, there's Kona coffee, there's Ka'u, there's Wailua. Um, and so the question is, why are these so good? Uh, and what is the difference between them? Do you have a preference? Wow, or do you want to plead the fifth? You can also do that. <laughs> there's, a, a, there's a lot of complicated answers there because I believe in complication. Um, in Hawaii, we grow coffee on five different islands commercially. Um, and is that true? Maybe it's four. I don't think Lanai grows coffee commercially. Anyways, we grow coffee in a bunch of islands in nine or 10 different regions. And by region, I mean geographical region. And within each of those regions, there can be some significant environmental shifts. Kona is a great example. There's a huge elevation shift in Kona where coffee is grown. And as we've talked about, it's not about elevation at all, but temperature, but you go up the mountain, it gets colder. And it's not far to drive, but it's far enough that the temperature shifts and you can notice it, both people and plants. So, so we have all these different places in Hawaii that grow coffee. And you know, if we just think about the temperature they grow in, it produces some different taste experiences. And if we think about how they're harvested with machines or by hand, we can get some patterns of taste differences. And I have had great coffees from every region. I, I'll be honest, I've had terrible coffees from every region. I've had terrible coffees from a single farm and great coffees from a single farm. Um, in a perfect world, right, uh, every step of the process happens beautifully every time. That's not always the case. Sometimes you can't control the environment. You can't control when it rains. You can't control various things. You just have to work with what you got. Um, but a coffee grown in Wailua is going to taste very different from a coffee grown in high elevation Maui or high elevation Kona or the variety grown in Kauai might be different than the variety grown in Kau and the varieties and the temperature and the way the farmers are dealing with the coffee is all going to create differences. So we have this great diversity in Hawaii and it's really, really cool actually. Because not only can you easily get these different coffees, because we have this thing called the post office that delivers mail to you every day, um, but you can find them really easily. You can go visit farms. You can find them online. You can read books about them. You can do all sorts of stuff. Uh, so I'm not going to plead the fifth. And I really do believe that there's a great 
diversity and that diversity is worth exploring and right the things i love might not be the things you love and all the more reason to explore because i might recommend three farms that you think are all terrible not because they're terrible because you just like different things than i do and that's okay so really if you want a more detailed response to that contact me separately let's hang out come visit me at the farmer's market booth on saturday mornings i'm happy to dive deep just we're limited here <laughs> time and scope good question though so Sean, we had two questions, one from Jeremy and Sherry just submitted a question about pea berry coffee. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, about that. I would love to talk about pea berries. I actually wanted to do my dissertation on pea berries, but that just didn't pan out. But I've read a lot about them because I think they're so neat. They're so mystical and magical. So when we, when coffee's growing inside this fruit, I don't have to demonstrate. Maybe you saw earlier, I've harvested all those. Most of the time when we have a single coffee fruit, there's two seeds inside. And as those two seeds grow, they push against each other on the inside, but on the outside, there's nothing pushing against them. So the cherry expands, the seeds grow, and they get a flat face on the inside because they're pushing against each other and a rounded outside face. And most coffee seeds look like that, right? Flat face, rounded side. But every so often, on every tree, one of those seeds doesn't develop. So normally we have two, but only one develops and has nothing to push against. So because it has nothing to push against, it's all round. And it's adorable because it's round and a little smaller. And we call them pea berries because they kind of look like peas. Now, every tree produces pea berries. Statistically, if you go to a lot of trees and count, that's gonna be something like four to 8% of the seeds, the dry weight of the seeds is gonna come from seeds that are shaped like pea berries. Are they different? This is the, the magical question. Are they different in some way besides how they physically appear? I think the answer is no. There's no definitive answer. All my research, all my experimentation, uh, anecdotal experimentation, I should say, not replicated or analyzed, um, leads me to believe that if you harvest the seeds from a tree and you separate flat face from pea berries and you roast them identically and you taste them side by side, they're gonna taste identical. And biologically, that makes a lot of sense because there's no reason a pea berry should be biochemically any different. It is shaped differently though, which means it's gonna respond differently in the roaster. So I think a lot of times when people are experiencing a taste difference with pea berries, they're tasting a roast difference. Not good nor bad, but it's true. Uh, pea berries are rare, right? They only happen four to 8% of the time on average. I, I do remember during my PhD work, I found a tree that had like 30% pea berries, just a genetic quirk. But most are in this, you know, 5% range. They're rare and they're adorable and they're pretty and they're around. That's what a pea berry is. A few more questions, three to be exact. Um, one is um, maybe more of a, a political question or whatever, however you have it, but what is, um, you know, there's obviously different coffee, um, coffee um, cafes and the prices of coffee range dramatically, very expensive to sometimes very cheap. Why is that? Is it a brand thing or is it really about the quality in which they brew and the beans that they source in your opinion? I'm gonna take a broader answer to that question. So the question is about, you go to a cafe and there's different coffee prices. Um, I, I wanna talk about not just in cafes, but generally speaking, what plays into a price of coffee? Cause that's gonna help answer the specific cafe question. So I mean, specifically for a cafe, you know, the location, the, the cost a cafe is going to incur with what they're doing and where they are will have a role, right? A, co a cafe in Hawaii buried deep in a valley with no stores around it probably has lower rent than something in Waikiki. So, Businesses have costs they have to deal with and that's gonna be passed on to the consumer in various ways. So it might be that where you're getting your coffee is gonna be more expensive because of where it's being made for you. The coffees that they use play a big role as well. And the best example for this is coffees grown in Hawaii versus coffees not grown in Hawaii. Our coffees are really expensive relative to the rest of the world's coffees. Is it because they taste leaps and bounds different and better than coffees elsewhere? No. Some of them are going to be worse. Some will be better. There's no, you know, try and true comparison we made there. But Hawaii is a very different place than the rest of the world. One, we're in the United States and there's lots of rules and ideas that we farmers have to abide by to grow coffee and to support employees and the environment. And those create higher costs. And those higher costs get passed on down to everybody else, all the way down to the consumer in the cafe. We live in Hawaii. We're in the middle of some rocks in the middle of nowhere. Things have to get here. 
cost of producing anything in Hawaii is more. Cost of getting things to produce things in Hawaii is more. So that's going to make things more expensive. And from a farmer's perspective, our farmers live in Hawaii. They want to live in Hawaii and they want to live decent lives in Hawaii with amenities that you and I all want to have too, like cars and TVs and cell phones and vacations and dining out. And, you know, if, you know, if they lived in little grass huts in the middle of nowhere and had access to none of these things, they might be able to charge a little bit less, but they live here and they want to live like us. So they have to charge prices for their coffees to help them live like you and I want to live. And personally, I think that's a great thing. I want my friends who are farmers and people who are doing this thing they love for a living get to live in a way that's comfortable. So all these things play into why Hawaiian coffees are more expensive. And in various places around the world, they have similar complicated issues with how they produce coffee. Sometimes coffees are rare. Sometimes the industry thinks they're extraordinarily tasty and charge more for, or, and spend more on them. Sometimes coffees go through an auction system and as auctions can do, they can create really high prices for things. So there's lots of reasons why coffee might cost more to somebody that gets passed on down to the consumer. Within a cafe, right, they have the cost of the coffee plus the cost of operating their business plus, you know, capitalism. If they will buy it, you should charge it. There's always gonna be a little bit of that. You just have to decide, are all the things you're getting from that experience worth that particular price? And if the answer is yes, then the system is working perfectly. If the answer is no, you can still buy it and be disgruntled, or you can walk away and not buy it and find something else. It's complicated, and I'm not even sure I did enough justice to, be, to the answer to really cover all the bases. Thanks, Sean. So second to last question from Sherry, which I like her question is, I love the taste of lavender and would like to know the best way to add this flavor to my cup. And I guess in general, you know, because obviously there's cream and sugar, which people think about, but what about other type of organic flavors or food flavors that, and what is the best way to incorporate it if they wanted to experiment? Coffee mixology, I guess. That is a super question. There's a lot of answers. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to narrow down the box, which we're going to work in here, which we're going to play in, which is let's assume that you have unflavored black coffee and you want to create the flavor yourself in some way versus you know, buying a flavored coffee. So one way to do it would be very sort of mixology-like, which is to make a syrup or an extract of, in this case, lavender. You, know, you can put some lavender in water and you want to add sugar and sort of extract the lavenderness into that other liquid and now pour that into your cup after you brew it. Some things, and I suspect lavender might be one of them, but I've never played with it, so I don't know. Um, you can add to the bed of coffee grounds while you're brewing. Some things like cinnamon, you can add to the pot and while you're brewing it, the, you know, the coffee will fall on the cinnamon stick and extract there. There's lots of very simple, just put all the pieces together kind of way of adding flavors. But if you want to be you know, manipulative and precise, creating some kind of a syrup or extract with water or alcohol, depending on what it is, right? There's no right answer. This is getting to fun chemistry territory. It's gonna depend on the thing and you want to do it in such a way that ends up creating a flavor you like. I am sure there's lots of flavor extracts you can find um, for common retail use. You might have to do a little bit of looking, but people are crafty, and I bet you could probably find lavender flavor, lavender extract, which you could then add to your coffee and just enjoy it that way if you don't have flowers that you want to play with yourself. Okay, Sean, I, I lied because I, I feel like we're going to have an uprising if we don't ask one more additional yes. question. Um, Cause there are a few people that ask and it's about your opinion. And I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Kopi Luwak coffee. <laughs> ah, Kopi Luwak. Yes. Before I answer with my opinion, I always feel the need to share the best commentary I've ever heard about Kopi Luwak. But first I should describe it to those of you who don't know. So in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia, there's a, cat-like creature called a civet cat. It's a mammal, lives in the forest. Um, coffee is not native to that area where it grew up, where it is native to. But it found coffee and it found that it likes to eat coffee cherries because the coffee fruit is a fruit. It's got some caffeine in it, it's sweet, it's chewy, you know, it's perfectly okay to eat. And you know, a lot of fruits are made so that something will eat it and then poop out the seeds somewhere else so that the plant can spread its genes around the area. So the civet cat, We'll eat the cherries and poop them out. Nothing unusual about that. 
the unusual part is that somebody once thought, look, there's processed coffee seeds there. I can just take the poop and get all the coffee seeds out and remove the parchment and roast it and brew coffee out of. So that's what Kopi Luwak is. And there are other animals that do this. There's a bird in Brazil and there's elephants in Thailand and I think some monkeys somewhere. Animals eat fruits and poop them out. In this case, we harvest them and then we make coffee out of it. So that's what it is. And before I give you my opinion, there's a really famous guy in the specialty coffee world named George Howell. And George Howell says, and you know, if, if naughty language is not good for your ears, you might want to cover up. He says, <laughs> Kopi Luwak is coffee from assholes for assholes. And I just think that's super clever because it's such a gimmicky thing, this Kopi Luwak. In its most basic form, right, I can appreciate someone wanting to try something different. But imagine like how much coffee you have to collect to make a cup of coffee out of all these poop droppings around a forest, right? In a perfect world, we're not caging these things, which happens. So the Kopi Luwak industry has gotten pretty dirty in terms of caging animals. But before that, even before we started caging animals to make this coffee, like the effort to go through for this coffee, pretty extraordinary, which is why it's so ridiculously expensive and why it's so storied in our culture. The question is, is it worth it? Does the coffee taste significantly different? Unfortunately, I have to give you a, a less spectacular answer. I've never had a really good example of it. I've had several examples of it, but it tends to be Kopi Luwak that someone bought for me while traveling in Southeast Asia. And it was roasted, not so great. It was pre-ground and it was stale by the time it got to me. And I always try it and it tastes like stale coffee. I've never had freshly roasted, well-roasted Kopi Luwak. There's a bit of research that shows it is biochemically different than coffee that doesn't go through the gut. We don't know if that's important, but we know it's different. Um, I just seems like a lot of work for something that's probably not gonna be that different, right? We know that how you ferment coffee, right? I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about removing the mucilage that we can, we can spike the fermentation take with different yeast and that's happening. And it makes some slight flavor differences. And this is another way of doing that. It's totally fine. And there's some novelty about it, which I, I admire. And I, and I admire the crafty, you know, entrepreneurial aspect of it. But, you know, there's not that much of it. And it's one of those things that went from weird local novelty to caging animals and inhumane ways. And that just puts a really bad taste in my mouth. And it's just, there's plenty of good coffee out there. We don't need to create this thing that has a bad, dark history to it that, it's just not, it's just no reason, it's not worth it. So my personal opinion is, eh, it's not, you know, what it's become is not worth it, it's not important. I mean, you can get lots of great coffee through other ways. But is it really different? I suspect not so much, but I don't really know. Hey, thanks, Sean, I, I, I think that was our last coffee, specific coffee brewing question. The last really question is for you, and that is, tell us a little bit about, you mentioned that you're at farmer's markets, you know, you have a coffee delivery business. Why don't you tell our viewers a little bit more about that? Shameless plug for a second. All right. Well, there's all kinds of shameless plugs. I should mention I've written three books and all my publishers would love you to buy those books. They're all about coffee. Um, so if you want to dive deeper without having to talk to me, that's a great way of doing it. Um, so I own a couple of companies. One is a consulting company, which I work with all kinds of folks from farmers to consumers all on the production chain. But more locally oriented and more, you know, interacting with you folks if you're here on this island. So I have a booth. Um, at the Kakako Farmers Market on Saturday morning. Uh, that company is called Grok Coffee. Um, you can just come and get coffee at the booth and buy beans if you want and buy brews and just talk story. Um, Grok Coffee also offers bean service, which is why I have these really awesome mason jar lids with the valves. Where it's sort of like old school milk delivery where you buy a jar of beans, however many ounces you want, and I deliver it to you. You come pick it up and every week you can get a different amount. You can get different beans because I rotate the beans every week. Sort of a subscription service without the subscription. Um, coffee.net if you really want to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, I'm a coffee guy. I just do coffee things all the time. I'm happy to talk about coffee. I'm happy to answer questions for the next three hours if you guys can handle it, but I suspect that's not going to be too kosher for folks. So I think we need to wrap up. Is that right? I want to say one or two quick little things as a, you know, if you forget everything else I've said or you fell asleep because you weren't drinking enough coffee, um, probably the most important idea I can say to you is this. I, you know, I have a, 
I have a position to stand up here and say, look, I'm a coffee expert. I know a lot about coffee. I can tell you a lot of things and I can dive really deep. I can't tell you what good coffee is. Good coffee is a coffee that you like. And all of these things that we talked about, you might manipulate them, you might try to finesse them, you might try to do it just as I described. But if, if the end of the day it doesn't taste good to you, then something's not right. right? Do what tastes good to you, because more importantly than what the expert says is that you like it. So my role is to help you get to what you like, not to tell you how to do it. Um, I'm just happy to help. Just trust yourself, be okay that our experiences are different, that we're different people, and celebrate that. And don't be shy, go explore, taste things you haven't experienced. If you like milk and sugar, try coffee's black once in a while. It's okay if you don't like it, but trying it is an experience worth having. You might taste other things that you weren't tasting before. You might just like it, it's also okay. Add flavors and sugars and whatever you want. There's no right answer. Your joy is what is most important. Um, that's all we got. Thank you so much for spending all this time with me. I'm flattered, I'm honored. I hope that uh, we bump into each other, especially all you folks on Oahu. I love to talk about coffee. I will bore you to tears if you let me. Um, have a great morning and go drink something yummy. <laughs>